you have a Bible, let's go to the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2, and that's where we will uh, continue our series this morning. Um, my wife Jen and the kids are up in BC this weekend. Uh, there's a wedding in the family, as well as uh, Jen's getting to visit, uh, spend some time with her mom, who's going through chemo, as you know. And so I've been uh, home alone the last three days. This is probably the first time I've left the house since Friday. <laughs> And um, seeing how far a bag of Juanitas can get a guy. And uh, it's not good for a man to be alone. Somebody said that somewhere, and I would attest to it. But uh, it is good to be with you this morning. Um, this, uh, this chunk of James has to do with the idea of seats of honor um, and, uh, and lower seats as well. I wonder if you've ever had an experience where you've, been, where you've gotten really good seats. Um, maybe at a concert or a sporting event or something like that. Uh, we went to Munch and Music on Thursday night. See Brett Denon. I know a bunch of you guys were there. Uh, Brett Denon's kind of a family favorite for us. I've got a few of his records, kind of a modern day Paul Simon, singer songwriter sort of guy. And so the kids were excited. I think it was their first concert. We went down to Munch and Music, and there's thousands of people spread out across the lawn. We're standing way in the back when Denon comes on and could barely see him. And I saw this spot up on the side of the stage. And I'm like, hey, let's go stand up there. And so the kids and I sneak up to the front and literally are standing right on the side of the stage, six feet away um, from Brett Denning. And Mila's actually like standing on the stage and dancing. And they have no idea. This is their first concert and they are front row backstage, actually on the stage. And they don't know how amazing this is. Um, but it was, a, it was a great night and we had a blast. So having good seats uh, is a fun thing. What's the worst seat you've ever had? Probably on an airplane, right? Uh, I know for me, uh, several years ago, I was on a flight to Hawaii. I was going over there to preach at a church, you know, suffering for Jesus. And um, I, my seat was really in the far back, and it was a middle seat, and I was kind of one of the last guys to get on the flight. And when I get there, there's these two 300-pound dudes in A and C, and I've got B. And uh, it turns out they're brothers, Joe and John, and these guys had propped up the uh, armrests so much so that they, there was no seat B anymore. <laughs> they were touching, and... I kind of stand there going, there's got to be another way, and the stewardess just laughs at me like that we got no other seats. And so uh, they get up, I sit down, they sit back down, and we are touching all the way down on both sides <laughs> for six hours. And um, it was one of the worst seats I've ever had. So uh, that's going to kind of tie into some of the stuff that James talks about this morning. As you know, James is a book of what we might call practical wisdom, practical wisdom. So unlike a lot of the Apostle Paul's letters, which go to great lengths to unpack and explain what the gospel is, as James writes, he assumes the gospel. He assumes that his readers have a functional definition and understanding of what the good news of Jesus is all about. And so what he does is spends his time describing what your life will look like if you truly believe this this gospel, if you truly trust the Savior, if you were to truly pledge your allegiance to Christ and his kingdom, or in other words, what would it sound like if your faith and your life rhymed? If there was a consistency, a wholeness, an integrity, a congruency between what you believe and how you live. And so that's what James is doing, saying if you really believe this story, of God coming to us in Christ with the mission of making all things new, then how would that actually show up in your lives beyond just a doctrinal statement? What does that look like when your life and your faith rhyme? And so today, the focus is on this idea of justice, mercy, and hospitality. That as the followers of Jesus living in his community, marked by his kingdom together, that if we are to pursue consistency between our life and our faith, then one of the things that's going to show up is that we would be a community marked by justice, mercy, and hospitality. And so he starts in verse 1 by saying, believers in our glorious Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Favoritism partiality, prejudice, or discrimination. And so inside the church, 
James is, if you remember, he is the, one of the lead pastors of this first church community in Jerusalem. And within that church, he's observed that there is a tendency among the body of Christ to show partiality or favoritism towards certain types of people. And he says that if we do that, he says we, down in verse 4, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Judges with evil thoughts. And so basically the picture there is that when we discriminate, when we show partiality or favoritism towards one type of person over another within the family of the church, we are essentially perverting justice. We are like a judge or a lawyer who's receiving bribes in order to steer the outcome of the trial. Justice has been perverted. That's how big of a deal he says this is when we treat one class or group or culture of people differently than another, he specifically calls this sin and says that we are perverting justice. Now, this is the way of the world. Discrimination, prejudice, partiality, favoritism. Maybe you caught the story in the New York Times about three weeks ago. In New Jersey, 16-year-old kid <clears throat> videos himself sexually assaulting a high school girl at a party sends out the video via text to a bunch of his friends with the caption, when your first time having sex is rape. Goes to trial, stands before the judge, and the judge in the end says, because this kid is from a good family and gets good grades, I'm going to let him off. And um, obviously there's an uproar and thankfully the, the case is being passed on to a higher court. But this is the way of the world. And imagine if this kid didn't come from a good family or didn't have good grades. Imagine if he was poor. Imagine if he was Muslim. Imagine if he was African American. Or what if he was an undocumented citizen? Do you think that would have shaped the outcome? Of course it would. And so this is the way of the world. It was at the time of James, and it is in our day as well. That deep within the evil powers beneath the system of this world is this tendency and practice of favoritism and partiality. James calls this sin. And in fact, throughout the passage, he says the sin of partiality or favoritism is just as serious as the sins of adultery or murder. And if you break one part of God's law, you break it all. And so he introduces this case study. And uh, the picture is that there's a church service, maybe something like this. And in walks uh, a very obviously wealthy person. Somebody that's got it all together, rolls up in a really nice car, has really nice clothes. They're obviously successful. Maybe even they're famous or, or well-known. And they come in and they get VIP treatment in the church. They're, 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 uh, they get all the attention. They get all the access. Everybody is treating them really well. And then he says, and then imagine that this homeless dude walks in. And, and he stinks. And he smells like urine and cigarettes and B.O. And he's pushing his cart in. And as he comes in, people just say, hey, go, go hide in the corner. You, don't, you can't sit here. You've got to go sit back there. And James uses this illustration, and we don't know if it's something that has actually happened within this church community, but he's saying this kind of thing cannot happen within the church of Christ. He says this hierarchy of human value that's been constructed within the church where some lives, some human souls are deemed more valuable than others, where some people get more attention and access and privilege. He's saying if that's the kind of culture you've created in your community, then you don't understand the gospel. If you're showing favoritism or partiality to one social group, one racial group, one cultural group, one class over another, then you are operating out of alignment with the heart of Jesus and the nature of his kingdom. 
So James argues that the gospel produces a social ethic amongst God's people where the net worth of the poor man is equal to the net worth of the rich man. That financial resources or the lack thereof are irrelevant to the value that we would impart to other human beings. And so therefore, he's saying, this should not be a defining issue in the social dynamic of the Christian church. Our social status, our paycheck, what we drive, what we wear, how we smell, when we show up as the body of Christ, he's saying, those worldly classifications have no place here. Because we are brothers and sisters of Christ and sons and daughters of the Father. And so James argues here that showing favoritism towards the rich is a violation of what he calls here in verse 8, if you keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. The royal law meaning the law given by the king himself. King Jesus describing life within his already but still coming kingdom. A life marked by love for neighbor. And he says when we show favoritism or partiality to the rich or any other group, we are violating this royal law. We're violating the very heart and vision of Jesus for what his church is to be. And so the idea is that how we, collectively as a community, treat and welcome and include the poor displays our allegiance either to the ways of the world or the ways of the kingdom. It's a very basic litmus test. Is, are you a community that is welcoming that is hospitable, that is inclusive of those unlike you, of those that the world would classify as saying their souls hold lower value than others. He's saying if that's true, then you are living out of alignment with the kingdom. And so, again, favoritism is judging one soul as more valuable than another and specifically doing so on the basis of of empty, worldly criteria. So I'll just pause for a moment and contextualize this for us locally because this is what James is doing. He's asking a speci- a, 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 these local congregations to think about and to take an inventory of their church and say, are you, are we, Antioch, a congregation that is prone to show favoritism or partiality? Are we, to- are we prone to be prejudiced or discriminatory towards the other, whether that other be the poor or whether it be an ethnic or cultural minority, whether it be somebody who lives and believes differently than we do? Are we known, are we becoming more and more of a community of radical hospitality where the classifications of the world are meaningless here? And we accept and welcome one another in Christ just as we have been accepted and welcomed. And so we've gone to great lengths as a church to build up our hospitality ministry. And Evan, as our community and hospitality pastor, oversees a series of teams that are welcoming you out front, that are getting coffee and donuts, that are greeting you at the door doors that are available to pray for you, and and we create space every Sunday, and I know some of you are a little squirmy during that five minutes of kind of getting to know each other. None of you are more introverted than me. I guarantee that. Um, And so I know that it's awkward, but the point is that we're not here to watch an event. We're here to come to Christ together. And the other people in the room, that's not an inconvenience, That's the point, that we're here to be together. And so what I'm saying is, yeah, there's certain things we're trying to do programmatically or structurally from a leadership level to create a culture of hospitality and inclusion. But ultimately, we're talking about us. What does this family look like? What are we marked by? What is the culture amongst the relationships of those that are part of this community? 
And my hope is that we would in, continue to grow in this radical grace of welcoming, accepting, and loving all people, not on the basis of the world's categorization, but according to the heart of God that is turned towards the poor, turned towards the oppressed. And so the case study that James uses here has to do with socioeconomic status, but that's not, he's not limiting it to rich or poor. It's simply a case study getting to the underlying point of partiality and favoritism. So turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 6, and I want to show you a beautiful example of what this looks like in James' leadership himself. He and the other apostles who are pastoring this early church community in Jerusalem, they actually have put this into practice in a really beautiful and brilliant way. And so in Acts chapter 6, there are these two cultural groups that make up the early church, the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. Okay? Hellenistic Jews are those that speak Greek and are culturally more Greek, more cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan, more influenced by uh, the Greco kind of empire and influence. And then the Hebraic Jews are those that speak Hebrew. And they come from this much more uh, Hebrew or conservative uh, kind of culture. And these two groups, uh, by the power of the gospel, have become one. The Greek-speaking and the Hebrew-speaking Jews have, have formed one congregation, and something that that church is committed to is what they call the daily distribution. And so as the church gives their tithes and offerings, a portion of that is set aside to be distributed to those in the church who are in need whether they're poor, whether they're homeless, whether they're food insecure, um, specifically the widows and the orphans, those that need the church family to survive. And so there would be a daily distribution of funds and of food to care for the needy within the church. By the way, this is something that Antioch is, is committed to as well, that 10% of every dollar that comes in into our offerings is set aside for compassion and justice ministries. It means it's given towards those both within our church and within our city and around the world that are in need. We have a benevolence team that is stewarding this fund. And when there's people within the church that are having a hard time paying their bills or whatever the situation is, the church is happy to come alongside and in a daily distribution, so to speak, and help meet those needs. But the thing that's happened here, well, let's just read it in Acts chapter 6. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of the food. And so they're saying uh, it's the Hebraic widows that are getting most of the attention and most of the support, and our Hellenistic widows are being overlooked. Okay? And the primary leadership of the church were he Hebraic Jews. So the twelve, the apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said it would, be, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to the prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the idea is there is some inequity within the distribution of support within our church body, that the Jewish-speaking uh, people are receiving more attention and more access than the Greek-speaking people. This is brought to the attention of the apostles or the elders, and they say, okay, that's not okay. We're going to do something about that. So let's form a committee or a team to steward these resources with the purpose of making sure there's an equitable distribution am amongst the church members. And so, verse 5, this proposal pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Okay, here's what's so interesting and what would be easy to miss. 
So first of all, the apostles do say, yeah, we do need an equity of distribution and mercy and care amongst specifically the widows in our church. We understand that the power dynamics, it's probably not intentional. It's not like the Jewish leaders that were overseeing the benevolence were going, make sure, make sure we take care of the Judaic Christians first. It's just something that they couldn't see. They were more connected to the Jewish-speaking widows, and they had more relationship, and so therefore those widows had more access. And so Peter and the other apostles, or James and the other apostles go, um, we need to do something about that. They pull this team together, but what you wouldn't know is that these seven names are all Greek names. And all the apostles had Hebrew names. And so what they are doing is saying, we're not going to assume this position of power, but instead we're going to give it away. We need people from this minority group to shape this ministry. And so the apostles with Hebrew names empowered the disempowered to make sure everybody was treated with equity. What a beautiful and brilliant solution. You may have seen this graphic before going around on Facebook or something like that. The difference between equality and equity. Equality is when everybody receives the exact same amount of help, support, aid, whatever it is. But equity is when that support, that love is distributed on the basis of understanding that people are coming from different places, different cultures, some more privileged than others, some with more access than others. And this is not a modern, liberal, Marxist kind of idea. This is exactly what the apostles were doing 2,000 years ago in the very first church. Recognizing the needs of those among us and saying, we are called to love all people, but there are some that need even more love. And so as followers of Jesus, there's an invitation to us to become a community marked by justice, marked by equity, marked by mercy, and marked by this radical, loving hospitality that actually turns our hearts towards those who need love the most. And he says, don't show favoritism, but if you're going to give special attention to anyone, it should be the poor. It should be those who are lacking, those who are despised and rejected and oppressed by the systems of this world. If you're going to give special treatment to anyone amongst you, the heart of Jesus is turned towards the poor. And the word he uses throughout this passage, back to James chapter 2, is the idea of mercy. Verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by a law that gives freedom. Verse 13, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. When he uses the word mercy, what's he talking about? Sometimes we think to, be, to show mercy simply means to be kind or to be forgiving or to be generous or something like that, to not hold a grudge or seek revenge. And there is a general use of the word mercy. But here, within James's epistle, he's clearly using the term mercy as something much more specific and concrete by, than that. Think of the story in the Gospels when Jesus is walking along the road and the two blind men cry out, Lord, uh, Lord Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus goes and he heals them. When they said, Jesus, have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy, were they, were they saying, God, be nice to us? Be kind to us? Or were they even asking, God, forgive us our sins? No, they were saying, we can't see. Our eyes don't work. Would you have mercy? Would you meet our need? Would you heal our eyes, heal our vision? That's the way that James uses the word mercy. 
a loving, compassionate, empathetic, active attentiveness to the well-being of those who are in need. And so as followers of Jesus, we are to be a community marked by radical justice, mercy, and hospitality. Now why? Even though James does practical wisdom, he's not pragmatic in the sense of saying, I'm your pastor, you have to do what I say. But he's careful to go, there is a theological reason that the community of Christ should be the most just, merciful, and hospitable community in the world. What is that reason? The reason is that Jesus is the Lord of glory. That Jesus is the Lord of glory. When we think about glory, we don't just mean like kind of shiny and bright. We mean that he is of utmost importance in all of creation, in all of the world that he reigns supreme, that he is the most supremely important thing and person in the world. And when we understand the glory of Jesus, then we become a community marked by justice and mercy. The reason is because, and James will get to this later in chapter 3, that the story of God and his people begins with God creating humanity within his own image and likeness. That the king of glory speaks humanity into existence to bear the image of his glory. So we'll get to this in a few weeks, but I'll just give you a quick taste. In James chapter 3, listen to how uh, uh, how he frames up this plea to speak well of other humans. With the tongue, James 3, 9, we praise our Lord and Father... And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. James is basing his argument for justice, mercy, and hospitality in the doctrine of the Imago Dei. The idea that all humans everywhere have been created by God and bear his image and likeness and therefore uh, represent a piece of his glory in the creation. And he's saying, how can you praise God with one part of your mouth and curse your neighbor who bears the image of God in the other side of your mouth? He's saying that is inconsistent. That doesn't rhyme. If you say that you praise and love God, how can you speak poorly? How can you insult? How can you curse those who are made in God's image? So way back in Genesis 9, there's this original command that the reason that we aren't to do harm or be violent and especially commit murder uh, amongst humans is because humans bear the image of God. And James takes that idea all the way down to the daily, like most of us haven't ever killed anybody, but he's like, have you ever insulted another person? Have you ever taken a shot at their dignity, at their value? at the worth of their soul? He's saying, then you've insulted the image of God. That's how serious this is. That's how serious this is. And so this doctrine of image of God, Imago Dei, has been central to this movement of Christ's church throughout the generations. And there have been times, and we have to be honest about this, where Christianity has totally screwed this up and left it behind. And we have even, as a church, done violence, committed murder, even genocide, in the name of God. And it doesn't rhyme. It doesn't make sense. But then we have these moments where it does. Think about the civil rights movement in the 60s, led by Dr. King and others in, in King's work, The American Dream. Here's what he writes. The concept of Imago Day is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected. And this gives everyone a uniqueness, a worth, a dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation. 
There are no gradations in the image of God. I love this. Every man from a treble white to a bass black are significant on God's keyboard precisely because everyone is made in the image of God. What was Dr. King's foundation for the civil rights movement? This very concept, the Imago Dei, that you will never look into the eyes of a person who does not bear the image of God. And therefore, all people, rich or poor or black or white or whatever other categorizations the world has, he's saying none of that matters within the family of God when it, when it comes to giving special treatment or preference. All people have dignity, worth, and value and therefore are to be treated and welcomed as brothers and sisters. C.S. Lewis says it this way, that next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. And so here's the vision that James has, and I share it. The vision for what this church community ought to be what we could be and what I trust by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit we are becoming. A community that's marked by the kinds of people that the world needs most. The people that will resist the polarizing categories of the world of liberal and conservative and Republican and Democrat and rich and poor and black and white and everything in the middle our allegiance is first and foremost pledged to King Jesus and to his kingdom. And when we look out across our neighborhood, across our workplace, across our city, we don't follow the ways of the world in showing preference or discriminating against uh, those that are different or those that are challenging for us, but that we would have the heart of Christ that recognizes the image of God in every single person. And yeah, that image is broken, right? It's broken in me, it's broken in you, it's broken in our neighbors. But it is still there. And it is to be affirmed and called out and embraced. That's my dream, that Antioch would be the most eclectic, diverse, inclusive, hospitable, community anywhere. That we would be known by this radical hospitality, by this commitment to equitable justice. That we would be known as those who show mercy, not just who talk about loving our neighbors, but who actually do it. Not those who just talk about justice, but those that are chasing it. This is what James is calling us to. Not just to agree that these things are important. Not just to nod and say, yeah, that makes sense. But he's saying, if your life and faith are going to rhyme, then this is going to take the form of a life poured out in deeds of service. A life of loving those that the world deems unlovable. A life of coming alongside the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the refugee, the disadvantaged, the oppressed, the overlooked, and saying, we are with you. Now, his rationale for why we should be this kind of community starts with the idea of image of God. That all people bear his image and therefore deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. But there's an even deeper and stronger reason that this should be the case. In verse 7, he says, Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to you, whom you belong? What James is doing here is not just <clears throat> prescribing an ethics or a morality but he's actually going after the identity of his readers. To live a life of justice, mercy, and hospitality as a community is consistent with who we are. 
not just what we should do, but it's who we are. We've been given a noble name. We've been adopted into the family of the king. We have been appointed heirs, co-heirs with Christ of all the blessing and all the life of God. We are the recipients of so much. But how did we get that noble name? How did we earn this place of prominence? How did we get access to the presence of God? Did we earn it through our good works? It was given to us by grace. God himself was gracious to us, was merciful to us. The picture of the poor man that walks into the meeting wearing filthy old clothes. Think as filthy as you can. Urine, feces, BO, nicotine, an off-putting odor. And that's the way that the Bible talks about our sin and our standing with God when we were enemies and strangers of God. That even our righteousness was as filthy rags. We are the unwanted outsider. We are the filthy, poor, homeless addicts strung out in the gutter. And God in his great mercy comes to us and he sees his image in us. He affirms his love for us. And he pulls us into his life by entering into ours in Christ. And he gives us a new name. And that's a name of nobility. When we look at the poor, the economically, financially poor within our city and around the world, those who understand the gospel will see that we're looking in the mirror. That we are just like them. But God was gracious and merciful and did justice and has brought us into himself. And even more specifically, how did he do that? Jesus shows up in our world as a poor man. As a king who laid down his glory to give us his noble name. And so when we see the beauty of what Jesus has done for us, we will want to reflect that glory into the world by becoming a community marked by hospitality, justice, and mercy. And so, my conviction is this. What is it that saves us? How is it that we are brought into a new, reconciled, and redeemed relationship with our God? Is it on the basis of our good works and morality? Or is it on the basis of God's love, grace, and mercy? We know that this gospel is not something we can earn. The gospel is that we have been redeemed by a gracious, loving, merciful God. So we are saved not because of our morality, but because of God's mercy. Now therefore, what should Christians be no most known for in the world? Being moral or being merciful? Nothing wrong with the pursuit of morality. But what if the thing that we were most known for was how merciful we are? How compassionate we are? How active we are in loving the poor, in caring for those in need, in coming alongside those who are oppressed and disadvantaged? What if that's what we were really known for? I have a feeling that all of a sudden this, the world around us would take note. They would notice something. That even though we don't believe what you believe, and even though we don't get your whole religion, your presence truly is good news in the world. We are glad that you are in our city. Because you are loving those who need love the most. I'm convinced that the vision of Jesus for his church as we pursue hospitality, love, mercy, justice 
and generosity will create the kind of people that the world needs most. When our life and our faith rhyme, we get to bear witness to this king and to his kingdom. As we live here in this place as visitors from the future, citizens of heaven, we get to announce the reign of Christ to the nations through a life poured out in deeds of service and sacrifice <clears throat> for those who need it the most. So we love because he first loved us. We show mercy because he has shown mercy to us. We do justice because he has done justice for us. And we know that it came at a great cost to himself. As Jesus suffers and dies for the sins of the world, we see that this life of mercy and justice is one that comes at a cost. That God would ask us to give up comfort and familiarity and safety in order to follow after Jesus. One of the beautiful things about this table that we share every week is that the table in our culture and every culture really represents relationship, represents family in a sense. And what's great about this table in the gathering of Christ's church is that this family is marked by the rich and the poor, by dominant culture and minority culture, by old, by young, and all the different categorizations that separate us in the world, we come together and share a table that would never be shared in the wild. We come together as a united family of Christ, rich and poor together. And even the very elements of the table, if you think about bread and wine. Bread is the food of peasants. Wine is the drink of kings. And in this one meal, they're brought together. And Christ invites all his brothers and sisters to come and to dine and to find life in him and then to follow him into the world that he loves. Will you stand and pray with me? I want to invite you to take a moment and ask God to search your heart. We'll just take this from the theoretical and the abstract to the specific, and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you show us the places in our hearts and in our lives where we are prone to show prejudice or discriminate against another group or class or race? trusting that you're speaking to us now, Holy Spirit. We're listening and we're asking for you to turn our hearts away from our sin and towards you. Would you give us a vision of your glory? Would you give us a vision of your beautiful creation that is a humanity made in your image? God, we declare and we proclaim in faith that racism, classism, sexism, has no place within the body of Christ. And we do not want to be caught up in the ways of the world. We want to be caught up in the life of your kingdom. So Lord, we pray that by your spirit you would help us to live a life that rhymes with our faith. That you would empower us with your grace to show mercy to do justice, to seek equity, to love our neighbors as ourselves, as you have dearly loved us. And we know that our attempts at good works and doing justice in the world are not the things that justify us or make us right with you, but they are a response to who you are and what you've already done for us. 
and what you are doing in the world. And we simply want to live in tune with you. We want to do what you're doing. We want to be part of your work in this city and around the world. We thank you that you have been merciful to us. And we pray that you would make us a merciful people. In Jesus' name.